it's not what it usually is talking about bio-inspired science and technology. Um, but what I've tried to do is to uh, collect some information about the links between bats and uh, humans play a role and then uh, the coronavirus. And uh, so as a disclaimer, I'm, of course, this is not my own original research. Um, but what I, I thought is that because I do work with bats and have been working with bats for a long time, and uh, so I, I, I felt that I'm dangerous enough or capable enough to read the literature. So what I've done over the last couple of days is spend a few hours trying to dig through the literature and trying to um, uh, distinguish a little bit what is it that we can actually say based on science and what is it that maybe is not or not what you might have seen. Um, if you if you follow the media, right, there's a lot of people are asking the question, how do we, did we get where we are now, right? What is the, uh, how, how, how did we get this uh, COVID-19 uh, disease? Uh, where does the virus come from? And so I said, okay, let me, let me do a little bit of a dive into the literature and see what can we say about bats and viruses. And maybe, uh, so, um, to start, give a bit more with a broader background, right? So COVID-19 is a, 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 a zoonotic disease, right? A zoonosis, that means a disease that comes from an animal uh, to humans. And uh, this is not such a strange concept, but although this is, of course, very special times now and, uh, with the disease, but um, the whole concept of diseases going from uh, animals to humans is, is not new. It happens in your own, or it can happen in your whole, own home. So if you are right now uh, teleworking from home and you have snuggled up with your favorite pet for comfort, right, that, uh, I have to tell you right, that pets, of course, also can carry diseases. Right? Dogs, for example, are, are a good example in that they uh, can carry rabies. Right? So this is the rabies virus. The CDC estimates that about 59,000 people worldwide a year die from rabies and 99% of those uh, rabies infections come from dogs. But rabies is actually a very special um, virus in that it has a really broad host spectrum. So the CDC website says that all mammals can get rabies. I mean, there's more than 5,100 species. I doubt that they have tested them all, but uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that. Uh, it is unusual, right? So you should bear in mind that you might have seen those pictures also a lot, but if you if you look at the life cycle of a virus that's on the left hand side here in the image, actually the COVID-19 uh, virus, uh, there's a lot of things, molecular machinery that has to happen, right? The virus has to get find the receptor, it has to get into the cell, it has to encode itself, it has to replicate its genetic information, make new proteins, assemble, um, assemble a, a new virus, then get uh, sped out uh, from the cell. So you can imagine there's a lot of molecular machinery that is needed. Uh, for that and every time you have these molecules interact, uh, th there has to be a match. Uh, and, and so for particular for viruses that infect uh, vertebrates, it is known that the, the, the um, receptors, that is a very critical thing, right? So if you look, uh, for example, this is again for COVID-19 here, this is the infamous uh, e ACE2 uh, receptor, uh, the, the molecular structure of that. And then on top here, that is the receptor binding uh, domain, the yellow thing of the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. And so you have to really like a lock and key, they have to match. And so typically, if you look across a, a family tree, that's the black tree here, so that's sort of the family tree of, of animals that could get infected by a virus, and you look at the infection success, right, the further away you go in the family tree, the um, the less of an infection success you have, right? And for those viruses that have a broad host spectrum that can affect many, infect many different species of animals, typically, if you look then at the receptor, uh, it's a receptor that is very conserved in evolution, so something that hasn't changed uh, that much in um, in evolution, and that's how you um, can actually get these broad. Uh, 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 infections. To continue a little bit with zoonosis, again, some of you might have a cat, right? There's also uh, other uh, animals that can have that. Cats, for example, they can have toxoplasmosis. Toxoplasmosis is not a virus, it's a, a, a single-celled um, 
organism that you can see uh, depicted here uh, that can also be very bad, particularly if a pregnant woman gets toxoplasmosis, but they, um, it, it can result in, in very bad disability in the, in, the, in the baby, right? So for example, if you're a royal watcher, the French royal family, at one time the Prince Francois, the pretender to the French throne, he and his sister, they both had con uh, congenital toxoplasmosis, uh, were disabled, right? If you, if instead you go for a hamster, right, it can give you a form of meningitis. That's also a virus. If you, if you, if you keep uh, birds to, to give you comfort, right, they could give you the parrot fever or nitosis. And actually, uh, there was a big outbreak in 1929 in the US that was actually also instrumental in establishing the National Institutes of Health, the NIH, in its current form that came from this parrot fever outbreak in 1929. So, so just as sort of a little bit background, right? So uh, yeah, that's the, the, this uh, parrot fever is actually a bacterium, a chlamydia, uh, bacterium, so it's a computer rendering of that one. So, so this just is a little bit of background. And now the first real question is, so with all these zoonotic diseases um, being around, are bats actually special? And so there's an obvious argument to make, right, why bats should be special when it comes to um, zoonotic diseases is that they live in these gigantic colonies, can be uh, millions of animals, in a few cases even tens of millions of animals, right, and that sort of smells like uh, a breeding ground for for, for diseases. Um, now, first I should say not all bats, right? There's about 1,400 different species of bats and not all of them um, f uh, live in these gigantic colonies. Um, uh, and um, and uh, <clears throat> so the other extreme is bats that are solitary. I mean, they all have to come together for mating, right? As the species would die out. But uh, there can be bats that are extremely solitary, right? Where you have one tree hole, one bat, uh, and, and that's it, right? Uh, the other interesting thing is that bats actually have mechanisms uh, for social distancing, right? So for example, has been shown, was a paper just in, I think in January this year, right, about vampire bats. These are vampire bats. Vampire bats, they live in um, small family groups. And so what the authors of these studies did, they, they take a fam uh, family group of vampire bats and uh, it took the bats and injected them uh, either with, um, uh, they injected them with the thing that's LPS here, uh, so lipi, uh, lipopolysaccharide, right? That's the thing, right? A substance, if you inject that into the body, it, it is like an infection, right? So the body will think it is infectious and it, uh, it is infected and it, it will trigger an immune response just like for an infection, right? So that's how you can mimic an infection. And then uh, the other group was treated with PPS, right? So that's a physiological saline solution that was the, the placebo. Right, and then on your, so that's what's happened here in the blue field is this placebo in the reddish area um, is the um, the mock infection, and then all this here these are lists of um, sort of social behaviors, and so you see the, if you look how much they, the the change in these how they occurred, but they tend to be all on the on the blue side, right? So, uh, so what's happening is when uh, when they, when you have a sick bat, I mean these were not really sick; it just mimicked an infection. Uh, so, if you have a sick bat, uh, these animals they they practice social distancing, right? So, bats have actually mechanisms to to avoid the the, the spread uh, of disease. Nevertheless, there is a lot of uh, viruses in bats, right? So, this is a study from a project that had been sponsored by USAID until uh, October last year called the PREDICT project. And the idea was uh, to go around the world to look at animal populations. And, and so in these 10 years, the researchers in that project, PREDICT project, they collected 140,000, I believe, biological samples, and then found more than a thousand new viruses, right? So these are all viruses, right? So the gray, uh, um, circles, they are all viruses. Are they, many of them, you see, they start with PREDICT, so they were named after the PREDICT uh, project, and they're all uh, coronaviruses, just like the virus behind COVID-19. Uh, and then the colored um, uh, circles, they are different families of bats, right? So you can 
see that uh, that they are all somehow tied to one or several uh, family family of that uh, bats, right? So uh, a lot of coronaviruses uh, in these bats. And the question is, well, whenever you look, you find something, right? But uh, if if we compare. But what is the picture? So here's a study from four years ago uh, that was sort of a meta analysis based on, 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 on data already available to look across different species of mammals and see how many uh, zoonotic diseases do these animals have right, or are known to exist. Right, so, so what you have in this blue plot up here is the number of species in each of those orders. And then on the other axis is the number of species that are known to be a host for zoonosis. Uh, and then you have this, this, many of them do not have that many species, not that many uh, zoonosis, so they are zoomed in in this orange, in the orange plot down here. And so what you can see is there is actually a, a very nice relationship, right? The more species you have, the more zoonotic diseases you get, and that makes sense. So uh, every species is an opportunity. It could have one. So the more species, uh, the more zoonosis. Well, if you look, right, so um, uh, the bats here, that's uh, the order Chiroptera, uh, they're even a little bit below that line. So they have a little bit less zoonotic diseases than they should have based on this prediction and their species number. I've seen other studies, other tests where it that they came out a little bit more, say, than the rodents. Uh, so I wouldn't read too much in that. Um, but I mean, it shows you two things, right? It, it shows you that bats doesn't, don't seem to be so special in the number of zoonotic diseases uh, that they have. And it also shows you, right, how widespread this whole thing is, right? So if you say, you know, heard this probably in these uh, days that people go now and they want to kill all the bats. Uh, and um, so if you really wanted to reduce the load of zoonotic diseases that are out there, uh, you would have to kill a lot of species, right? So for example, uh, right here in the figure on the right, right, the, the authors of that original paper, they looked at the six uh, mammalian orders which have the most species and then also the most diseases, right? And so these six um, uh, uh, orders, they account for 75% of all the zoonotic diseases in the sample, uh, but they also call, uh, account for 87% of the total mammalian species, right? So if you wanted to get rid of 75% of the zoonotic diseases, uh, you would also get rid of 87% of the mammal species of the world. And so it would be an interesting question if the ecosystem of the earth would then still be able to sustain humans with all those animals, animals gone. But so that gives you a little bit of a sense um, uh, uh, if bats are special in terms of the number of diseases they have. And uh, so the science from the papers that I have seen, there's really nothing to back that up. But um, the other question is, are they sort of special in their way to deal with diseases? And there are some ideas that this may actually be the case. And, and one thing that is often being put forward is this idea of flight as a fever, right? So if you get an infection, very often the body will react with a fever. And that's not just a sight thing, right? That a sight reaction, a byproduct, but it actually has an important physiological function, right? So if you raise the body, temperature, uh, a lot of uh, reactions right, that are related to your immune systems, things that are going on, uh, they are uh, somewhat uh, accelerated, run better, and so the fever really helps the organism overcome the disease. And so the idea is that if bats fly, they also, their metabolism, their body temperature goes up. There's an old uh, figure, a figure from an old paper, right, where you can see in the left-hand side, right, as the, in seconds after a bat starts flying, how the body temperature is uh, raking up. In the right-hand side, you can see, uh, again, over time, right, as a bat starts to fly, oops, um, flies over here, and then as it lands, you can see how the, the breathing rate in breath per second, how that goes up from less than, a bit less than three breaths per second to, to about 10 breaths per second. And actually, if you look at the metabolic rate, that not, that's not in these figures. Uh, so if you compare a bat that is flying with an awake and active bat that is not flying, um, it's 15 to 16 times higher. So, so this hypothesis says, look, these bats, they are in a way going into a fever, a couple of hours every night, so they are 
immune system, the immune response gets all this boost from this feverish state. So that's why they are much better protected uh, against uh, succumbing to diseases uh, themselves. Um, it sounds nice. There's not, not no real hard experimental evidence that this is the case. So this was a, an example here where researchers tried to test that hypothesis and said, okay, you know, we are going um, to take a cell culture and we are going to infect that cell culture um, with, in the left-hand side, an Ebola virus, on the right-hand side, a Marburg virus. Marburg viruses are very close relatives, the same group of viruses as Ebola. But then we watch over time how the concentration of viruses in the cell culture uh, goes up. So that means the cells in the cell culture are infected. They are producing those viruses. And then we do that with different temperature regimes to see if the temperature of the cell culture uh, impacts that. And as you can see, there's very little uh, difference between those uh, three curves in the two graphs. So that is interpreted as a negative result. That's saying, okay, so maybe temperature doesn't have this wonder effect that, that uh, cells can stave off infections uh, better. It's a limited experiment, so the jury is still out on that, but uh, so I think it summarizes what the situation is that at the moment there's no experimental evidence on this uh, flight as fever hypothesis. There are some established things that are different in bats and that may help them dealing with diseases, right? So an important um, immunological uh, molecular mechanism uh, when it comes to viruses infecting organisms infecting cells are these so-called interf interferon system, right? So interferons are messenger molecules. So if you have a cell here like the one on the left uh, and this cell gets infected by a virus, right? so the virus takes over the cell and tries to assemble uh, viruses, but the cell has a mechanism It has a switch for, as you see, it, it uh, um, uh, detects DNA damage. And when that happens, uh, the cell will send out messenger molecules. So it's sort of like an SOS message, but it doesn't mean other cells come to rescue me. It means save yourself. Right? So it tells the other cells, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm infected, I'm dying of a virus, save yourself. And so the cells that receive these interferons, they will then try to, or they will start to synthesize proteins that. Uh, uh, constitute a defense against the virus and then hopefully can deal better when, when the virus comes uh, to them. And so the interesting thing is that the, the genes that are behind this interferon system, uh, usually they tend to be in a low active state, but in bats they are always on. Right? So the bats, the interferon system of bats, they are always uh, on guard. And um, so that is something that actually has been shown in, in cell culture. Uh, so here's a, an, a, another cell culture experiment and it's two different cell lines. So on the left hand side is a cell line that was derived from a monkey. And on the right hand side was a cell line that was derived from a bat. Uh, and then again, these two cell cultures, they were um, infected with a synthetic um, a, a, a virus, rather again related to Ebola. And, um, and then it was measured over time what's the proportion of cells in that cell culture that were, were infected by this artificial virus-like uh, construct. And you see that uh, in the monkey cell line, this goes to about 30%. Uh, here, the, 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 the red lines, that is actually modeling. So ignore the modeling, just look at the data, but it goes to 30%. And in the bed, it, it barely... <coughs> excuse me, the bat, it, it rarely, barely reaches uh, 20%. So the bats seem to be able to stave off this um, infection uh, much better, and that has been inter uh, attributed to their always-on uh, interferon system. Another established feature of the bat's immune system that is thought to make them more resistant against um, diseases has to do with the... Um, immunoglobins, right? So the immunoglobin molecules, you see that schematically in the, um, in the, um, in the center here, right? So they are supposed to act, uh, attack um, yeah, contaminations that get into uh, the organism, right? Bind them, make them um, uh, not effective. Uh, anymore, and so they they have so for for this right they have some structure right where they have different uh, chains polypeptide chains that need to stick together, and then they have these variable regions, and these are sort of the claws mm -hmm. with which they grab the um, these uh, 
whatever uh, infectants, whatever gets in there. Uh, and so to, for these uh, immunoglobins to do their functions, uh, it's really important that these clawing mechanisms, they are very variable, right? Because you don't know what will be the next uh, attacker. And so you want to be flexible and you want to have the ability to grapple many different attackers, right? And so uh, the, the mechanism how this is done is that for those different components, uh, those different chains uh, in those immunoglobin proteins, uh, uh, we have different genes, right? So for each genes, we have different versions and we have them all, but uh, at the final stage, right, when um, the, 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 the instructions for making this protein, when this is finalized, is these instructions are being spliced and you decide then which version you want, right? So the, if you have these versions, you can make combinations, right? So it's uh, uh, like there's uh, this combinatorial explosion, right? If you have different versions for each component uh, and you put them together, uh, you can actually, um, you can actually, through combining them in different ways, you can make this, 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 get this variability that you need to uh, stave off a wide range of attackers, right? And so here is a comparison what that variability looks like in humans, uh, in pigs, and then in a species of bat, the little brown bat. And so you see these different uh, genes here, V, D, J, and how many types we have. See, in the humans, we have 40, 40 different types of this V gene, right? In uh, pigs, it's just seven. In, in the bat, it's 236, right? And the same thing for the D genes, for the J genes, right? And so in the end, you see that humans, we can um, make 576 combination of this immunoglobin uh, uh, intruder arresting tool, right? And uh, the bats can, the pigs can just make 14, and this bat can make more than 73,000, right? So their immunoglobin system is more diverse, more able to uh, adjust to different attacks. So that's another established property that the bat immune system has uh, that other species do not have. So there is some, some interesting things there. So that's what I wanted to say, how bats may be special in their immune response. Now I want to talk a little bit about the origin of, say, COVID-19 or, or, or uh, zoonosis in, uh, in general, right? How uh, can you actually find that, right? And so one idea to find where a, where a disease comes from that is suspected to have jumped from an animal to humans, right, is to find the index case, right? So find the first patient. So these, these figures here come from an... Um, Ebola outbreak in West Africa uh, in 2013, 2014, I think. Um, and uh, what the scientists here did is they, they think they found the small village in Guinea um, where the first case was. And they think they also identified the first case, right? It was a, a two-year-old boy. Um, and they then asked the local people and they said, yeah, this boy, he played next to that tree where there was a bat colony in there. Right. And then uh, the bats, in the meantime, the people actually had harvested the bats. They had then finally chosen not to eat them, but uh, because they had, in the meantime, they had heard that eating bushmeat might be a bad idea, particular during an Ebola, ongoing Ebola outbreak. Uh, but the bats were gone, but they could uh, then still look at the, uh, the feces that were left there and, and get some genetic information, and they could identify the bat. Right? But they didn't find the virus. Uh, and the other interesting thing is that apparently there's also no evidence that from the hunters, from the people who had collected those bats then and previously, uh, that anybody of them got sick. So, so these these index cases, right? It's always a bit of a of a guesswork, right? So you can, right, when people say, "Oh, scientists have determined this disease came from there," usually, if you go back in the into the original paper, there is questions, right? Like there always are in science, right? You look at something, and then there's always um, questions left, and that's also the case here, even for this sort of study. I mean, one thing is to find an index case; the other. Uh, idea is to to look um, sort of a bit more for epidemiological patterns, right? So this is actually from the current uh, COVID-19 outbreak, so a study uh, uh, from from Wuhan, China, uh, where 41 confirmed early cases, right? So 41 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Wuhan uh, uh, for December up to January, uh, I don't know, January 1st. 
uh, when this um, seafood market, uh, wet market in Wuhan, when that was closed. But so, and if you look at these 41 cases, but so the, the cases were classified with the color here, whether the researchers them were able to establish a link to that uh, Huanan uh, uh, wet market or were not able to do that. And you see that uh, two thirds of the cases here had actually a link uh, to that market, right? So that uh, is sort of why people, one of the reasons why there were also samples uh, analyzed, have been analyzed from that market where the virus was found. And that's why people think that the market is likely the origin uh, for this virus using this pattern. The other idea is, right, so one thing is to, to look on the cases, look for the very first case, look for the first cases, see if you can find some pattern in there. So that's one way to do it. The other way, if you particularly if you do not have that information or in addition, uh, is actually to go out into the, into, uh, the broader area and start searching um, uh, um, for animals, right, that might have a similar virus. So actually, that picture here, um, uh, this landscape is actually from rural Hubei province, the province where that surrounds Wuhan. And that picture I took in 2004, when we were on a bat catching uh, expedition in Hubei to look for the SARS virus, right? So the idea is you go to caves and you, you look for bats, and then you, you, you take swaps and, and you try to find viruses and see if they are similar uh, to, the, to the virus that you have in the human population and you try to establish a link. Uh, so in this case is what you do is what you, uh, uh, you look at the, at the genetic code of the, of the, uh, of the organism. Right? So in our case, I'm talking about viruses. Here's an example, uh, is a bacterium, it's a pig. Um, and, and, but the idea is right, that you have these, this genetic information right, so, uh, here and, and there's sort of different regions that code for different proteins right, and, or do other things and you would look for this region in one uh, set of uh, genetic code and then you would look for, for these other organisms, in this case bacteria or it could be viruses and you would try to match and see where, where, where are the matches between those regions and then you would have some measure of similarity. Right, you would say how similar is this, and then uh, if it's very similar, I would say, aha, so we are getting closer to the source, or if it's not so similar, then you would say uh, we are not so close uh, to the source, right? So, but you should be in mind, these, these viruses, the organisms, they mutate all the time, right? So if you look at the coronavirus uh, that you say, COVID-19 virus, um, that you have in, at one time, that you had maybe in early January in one place, and the virus that you find now in, in early April uh, in another, in other places, they all differ, right? They, they, they tend to mutate, they tend to change, right? So you're not going, it's not about saying, oh, I have exactly that virus, right? You, you'll find it a, 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 a closely related virus. So let's look at that for the virus behind COVID-19. Right? So it's actually a very simple virus, right? You have essentially, you have typically four structural proteins that make up the structure uh, of the virus, right? You have this infamous spike protein that binds to the receptor. Then you have an envelope that contains two proteins, the membrane protein, and then this E protein that's not quite understood what it really does. And then you have enough, uh, 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 the last protein, it uh, interacts with the RNA, the genetic information of the virus and, and forms sort of a, a structure uh, there. And then there's of course the enzymes that are needed to replicate the virus, the genetic information of the virus. And so if you, if you look right, so um, it, now you have different virus samples, but right? you can look at the similarity, right? So uh, that's what's done here. So up here you see the, the, the genetic code of the virus. So it's typically these coronaviruses, 27 to 32,000. Um, letters in their genetic code, right? So here, these two are the uh, enzymes that will replicate the genetic information of the virus. And then here you have the, the protein, different types of proteins. And then you can look here, uh, you can have sort of a sliding window along this genome and you can say, okay, so how similar are they, right? So the reference here is the uh, 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 um, virus behind COVID-19, and then you test different viruses that came from bats against that, and you see the, the 
two things, right? You see that different viruses are somehow more similar than others. None of them has 100% similarity. The best one is here, this blue one, the, the RATG13. Right? So if you heard people talk about the intermediate horseshoe bat, Rhinolophus affinis, right? RA is Rhinolophus affinis. So, the, affinis. so that is this, this is the virus, right, that people found the closest. But so overall, uh, if you look at the um, similarity in the genome, it's 96.1% um, is the similarity of this, this virus to the virus behind uh, COVID-19. But you can also see, right, in particular, if you look at the other viruses that are not so similar, right, that some regions are more similar than others, right? So the question, and even this uh, RATG13, right, this region, and this region is actually the region of the spike protein. You see that up here, the receptor binding one. Well, remember I told you earlier, that is really critical, right? So that is also not that similar, right? It's uh, sort of less than the neighboring regions. Right? So that uh, gives you some, <clears throat> some thought here. Uh, by the way, what you can then do with these similarities, just like you would do for other studies of evolution based on molecular patterns, right, you can make these family trees. And that's something what you see here on the right, right? So you see all these things, viruses that start with bat right down here, when it uh, did this telonycteris uh, and so on, they are also their bat gene genera. Uh, so, so, so you have, and then here is the, the human virus, and then you see, right, the, the, the different versions of the human virus from uh, here, right, they're all uh, designated Wuhan. So I guess these samples were taken in Wuhan. Um, and then you have the, um, the, the, the this RATG13 virus. And you see, so if you look at similarity, it really comes the closest to the virus that was in that human outbreak from, from all the viruses that were included in this analysis here. So what you can do then is you can take a look um, <clears throat> and uh, how fast this virus mutates, right? So you can take virus samples that were collected in early January from the COVID-19 virus, right? Uh, in early January, first week of January, second week of January, and so on until today, right? And you can see how many of those letters in the genetic alphabet of the virus have changed, right? And so you get uh, what is called here subs, right? The substitution rate per site per year, right? And, and so here you see two assumptions. One is the, uh, a very high substitution rate. The other one is a very low substitution rate. And then you can use that, right? That's called the molecular clock. And you can date, right? So you know, in a way, right? So it, it's definitely wrong to say that the, this uh, bat virus is the uh, ancestor of the current virus. It's just like uh, ourselves and the chimpanzee. Right, the chimpanzee is not our ancestor. Right, the chimpanzee uh, is like a cousin. Right, so we had a common ancestor a long time ago, and the same thing is true for this bat virus and the virus be behind COVID-19. Right, and then you can so you can take this the, the, the your estimate of how fast. Uh, these viral genomes change over time and say, okay, so how long ago uh, was this common ancestor of the bat virus, this, this one bat virus, again, I told you there are many, but this one, the closest relative of our uh, coronavirus here and the one in the bat, um, how long ago did they branch apart, right? And so you see the estimates are somewhere maybe 1995, Right, for the fastest substitution rate, or maybe somewhere in the 1960, uh, in the slower rate, right? So, in other words, the, the common origin of this vi virus in the bat that is always treated as evidence, yeah, we got this from the bat, um, and the human coronavirus that uh, is now shutting us down, um, that is somewhere between 20 and 60 years ago. Right, that these two viruses, that's our estimate based on this data, that these two viruses actually had a common ancestral virus. So that's a, that's a while ago, right? So the question is, what, what happened in between? And then, so here's another analysis that has also been discussed in the media quite a bit. And the idea here was to say, okay, let's, let's don't, when, when we ask where is the closest 
relative, right? Where is the likely smoking gun for COVID-19? Right? Let's don't look at the entire 27, 30 something thousand uh, uh, letters in the genetic alphabet of the virus. Um, let's, or the genetic code of the, of the virus. Um, let's just look at um, the, the real critical part. Right? And remember when I talked about specificity, of viruses, I mentioned this receptor binding domain, right? So the part of those S, the spike protein that binds the receptor, right? And say, okay, if they are similar there or if they are the same there, that should count more, right? Because that really means you have this ability to infect humans. So that, so, so you see this, uh, this is not the genetic code, these are now uh, amino acids, right? That, that are here and you see them for the different, um, Different, for different viruses, right? So again, there is the, the SARS virus, that was the 2003-2004 coronavirus outbreak, then here's SARS-CoV-2, that's the one behind the current coronavirus pandemic, um, and then you have two bat viruses and two pangolin viruses. So I'm, I'm talking about pangolins in a moment, so if you don't know what that is, don't worry, I'll talk about it. Um, and, and so then you can look at the similarity, and then particular people said, look, uh, if we look at the binding between this receptor binding domain and the ACE2 um, uh, receptor, uh, they have identified five positions, five amino acids that are really critical for that. And they are marked by the red boxes here, right? So one, two, three, four, five. And so if you compare those viruses, and I made that in the corner here as a little for me to look it up. Uh, so if you compare uh, the co virus behind COVID-19, uh, the, bat, the best matching bat virus, that is this RATG13. And then the pangolin, you see for the best matching pangolin, um, the, these five amino, amino acids, they're exactly the same to COVID-19. Whereas for the best matching bat virus that you hear in the media a lot about it, there's only one out of five is actually matching. Right? So this, when you, when you hear researchers think now, that the virus came from a pangolin and not from a bat. This is the reasoning behind it. So, so I've talked a lot about pangolins. So what's the story about the pangolins? Right, so this is, if you have never seen a pangolin, that's, that's what it looks like. Right? So it's, it's, this, it's the only mammal that uh, has this kind of scale. Armadillo also has normal armor, but it's different from these scales. So it's the only um, uh, mammal with scales. There's a total of eight species of those pangolins um, and they occur in Southeast Asia for us. It's very easy to understand South Southeast Asia, four species in Asia, four species uh, in America, uh, in, not in America, in Africa, uh, there are none in America. Uh, and, and these species, they are heavily threatened. Right? And, and uh, one may, of course, when species are threatened, habitat destruction is always an important factor, usually almost always an important factor. Uh, here it is that um, these scales from the pangolin, right, they are believed to have medical value, right? So a lot of pangolins are being hunted uh, for those scales, right? Uh, but actually there is no scientific proof that they have any medical efficiency, right? So these scales, they consist of keratin. So that's the same material as in your fingernails. So if you uh, happen to believe that you know, you have a disease and pangolin scales uh, would make you better, then my recommendation is to save the money for the pangolin scales and to just chew your own fingernails because you're getting the same keratin that you would get from the pangolin scales. Unfortunately, uh, pangolin trading is wildlife trade is a, is a, is a big deal. And so here's a picture from a couple of years ago. I think it was the Indonesian um, authorities, the um, uh, they seized the shipment, and I think it was 4,000 pangolins, 4,000 refrigerated pangolins, right, uh, that were supposed to be smuggled uh, here to people who wanted to use the meat, they wanted to use the scale. Actually, just on Tuesday, the Strait Times in, in Singapore they reported a new record, um, record um, uh, 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 capture of pangolin scales, I think it was 25 million Singapore dollars worth of pangolin scales, 6.6 .6 tons, or just the scales, right? So you can imagine how many pangolins uh, have died uh, because of that, right? So, and uh, these, these samples that I've shown you before in the similarity match here, they actually came from uh, a pangolin scales that 
came from, from pangolins, that, not from scales, from pangolins that were seized by Chinese customs and they had been illegally smuggled from Malaysia. Right? So that, that really fits the pattern. So, so if it is indeed true that, that the pangolin was the immediate source, and again, you, you see right from the science, it's all just looking for similarities, right? So you cannot really observe this going on or nobody has been there to observe this first transmission, right? So it's all about similarity. But if that happened, has happened, the, the pattern is actually very similar to what happened with SARS, right? The SARS outbreak earlier uh, this century, right? Where the closest uh, match was uh, found in civet cats, right? So you learn a lot of exotic animals uh, these days, right? So the civet cat is this, is a fruit eating um, carnivore, right? So a uh, um, and uh, again, it is uh, it is prized in in Asia particularly for for food, right? So it's not medicine; it is food, right? So these animals uh, they are traded as a, a, a for food, and so a lot of the first. So talking again about epidemiological patterns, a lot of the first people uh, who were infected by. SARS in the early 2000s were actually restaurant workers, workers who had something to do with these um, civet cats. So that's why people think that this outbreak uh, in the early 2000s that came actually uh, from the civet cats. So here's actually a little infographics that summarizes um, all seven um, coronaviruses that are known to affect humans, right? So there's and that nobody knows there's a really definitely hundreds, maybe thousands, I have no idea, of coronaviruses, and seven have been shown to, to impact humans, to infect humans. Four of them have been around probably for a long time, and they are, they are part of the common cold, right? So around 15% of the cases of common cold right, uh, that people get every, every season right, uh, uh, actually is coronaviruses. The rest is other viruses, right? Uh, so some, uh, the date back, right? Again, this is the similarity analysis that I showed you, right? For some that has been dated back something like 900 years, eight, 900 years, right? Some to the maybe 200 years, right? So, so NL63, 229E, OC43, HKU1, these are these uh, uh, common cold viruses. And if you look at the reason, they all date back for HKU1, it's not known, but they all the other three, they date back a long, long time. And if you look at the others, right, you always see this pattern, right, that the, probably the closest host for SARS, it was the civet cat for um, MERS, it was a camel. Uh, if now the SARS-CoV-2, the virus behind COVID-19, right, if that indeed had come through a pangolin, right, it would be a similar pattern, right, that you have a virus, maybe the reservoir in the end, right? The evolutionary origin is bats because that's where we know there is a lot of uh, right. The argument that the that the evolutionary origin is bats is that we know a lot of coronaviruses from bats. You know, there might also be a sampling bias, right? So that is also not fully established. But the pattern really seems to be bat, and then something else: civet, camel, or maybe pangolin, and then human. That that seems to be uh, the pattern, right? So. Uh, so with that, maybe a little bit uh, sort of about this, this pattern of human transmission, right? And, and that has a lot to do with wildlife trade, right? So this is an infographic from the South China Morning Post where they have sort of looked at what are all the species that are involved in the wildlife trade in China, right? So this is for China. And you see this, these animals, they are colored in different colors. Yellow is for fur farming. This is just a three species here, the fox, the raccoon dog, and the mink. Then uh, green are all the animals that are used to make uh, traditional medicines. And then uh, well, whatever color of pink are the ones that are used to, for food, right? So it's, it's really like a little zoo, right? And, and so that obviously gives you a, a sense, right, that, that how diverse that is. And of course, with that also the danger, right, that you jump from one animal to the other, uh, that comes together. That also what I found very interesting in this infographic, these are data from 2016, um, is sort of the economic value of this trade. And you see, actually the fur farming is the biggest one, and that's really just three species. So from a, a disease prevention is probably not that 
uh, important. Right? And, and most of the species are here in the medicine and in the food, right? And yeah, it's a lot of money, right? The medicine, about 700 million US dollars. I'm using the current, I use the current conversion rate. I don't know what the yen was to the dollar in 2016. Um, so um, $700 million for the medicine, $17.5 billion for the food. I, uh, that's a lot of money, right? If, if, if I had that additional income every year, that would make a difference to me. But if you compare it to the Chinese GDP in 2016, 0.2% right, of the GDP. So that is actually something that you know, one could do something about without shutting down the economy. Uh, and uh, I mean, these are real risk factors, right? So you might have seen on the social media, you might have seen, but right, this is a thing that has been on the Chinese equivalent of Twitter, Weibo, but then it is supposed to be a menu from that Wuhan wet market where the, um, where the disease might have come from. It's unverified, so it's not known, but was it really from this? Was it from this wet market? Was it from another wet market? Is it a complete fake? Uh, so we don't know. But I've been to wet markets in the region, and I, I think things like that, it, it's like that, right? So you have a lot of animals uh, taken together. So uh, wild animals coming from a large area, from Southeast, from China, from Southeast Asia, from, um, from uh, uh, Africa, from South America even, right? And then you bring them all together into those um, wet markets, lots of individuals every day, so to say, coming in, lots of individuals, um, hygienical conditions. So this is not also not the wet market um, that uh, this came from, it's, but it's another street market in Wuhan, but also from the South China Morning Post. So that's a picture that they had that is, is verified, right? And you can see, um, the, the, the hygienical conditions here. Right? Uh, and, and you can imagine, right? so here in this basket, you see there's remains of a frog, there's fish, right here there's a chicken. Right? So you can really see how these things uh, might have happened, right? So, so uh, sort of the, to summarize, right? So you see there is behaviors here, although we don't know where it came from, that could obviously foster something like this, right? If you, so you take wild, animal species from a huge area around the world where you really sample viruses widely, you bring them together in one place, you start mixing blood and live animals and so on. And uh, uh, that's how, these, uh, how you can imagine that these things might, might happen. But right. actually, if you interact with animals in the wild, right? so not saying oh, it's all doom and gloom, right? it's actually quite easy to typically to deal with, with say, uh, infection risks. Right? So there's an example. This is one virus, right, the Nipah virus, that where you actually that is known to jump from bats for, to humans. Right? It's fruit bats. And uh, so it can also go to, there was a big outbreak a couple of years, quite some time ago, but in Malaysia where the bats actually infected pigs and then humans got infected. So if you have seen the movie Contagion, that was inspired by this Nipah virus outbreak in Malaysia. And so what happens is that right, the people, when they get it directly from the bat, this is where people have trees, right, uh, uh, palms, and um, the palms have a sweet sap and the people like to harvest that to, to use it for food. And then so the idea is that you wound the palm tree, so you make a gash in the palm tree and then the sap starts dripping out and you have a container where you collect that. And of course the, the bats are no fools, they like sweet stuff too. And so they will come there and they will lick the sap and if the bat carries this, the Nipah virus, the Nipah virus will end up in the sap that the humans harvest and then the humans will also get the Nipah virus. And so what the man here in the picture is doing, right, he has a, a little grit, right, that he can put over that tapping side and that prohibits it, right? So, so if you deal, keep let animals and humans keep a little bit of a distance, it's actually usually quite easy uh, to, 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 to have a little bit of a protection here and protect yourself from, from those viruses, right? So with that, I would like to, to, to summarize, right? So, uh, so my summary is that zoonotic diseases, right? They affect of life. They're everywhere. Your pets could have them. And then there's no reason to panic, actually, right? Because often they are very host-specific. So there's only a few that jump, right? So saying, oh, in the world, there's 10 to the 31 viruses, right? Most of them can never come to humans, right? So you should be aware of that. And then if you have basic precautions in, in uh, um, handling these animals, it can go a long way, right? So I would recommend, right, if you, if you now have lunch, don't eat lunch from 
on the same plate as your dog. Right? That that is a very good idea. So so don't uh, don't do that. That they can go a long way. But there are high risk activities. Right? And if the sort of the data and what they make like. Uh, is the origin of COVID-19 and what they make likely is the or has been the origin of SARS, but then we should really look into those high-risk activities, right? And that is uh, mixing many, this combination of three factors, right? That you mix many wild species in the same place, you source them from a wide geographic area, and then you have poor hygienic conditions, right? And, and these three things, they seem to, you can imagine that they are really a perfect storm. And I think that is the thing that we should uh, avoid going forward. And that might make a big difference in preventing things like, like COVID-19. Right? But we should be in mind that we really need the world's ecosystem to sustain us, right? So, so we need to protect healthy ecosystems where these animals live, right? So going and say, let's slaughter all the bats, uh, that would really have very, very big ramification. And if you remember the graph from earlier in the talk, we would have to slaughter a lot more animals than that. So that's not going to work, right? So risk management should be based on science, not fear, right? So we shouldn't go out and, and kill all those animals because uh, otherwise there will be again there will be no ecosystem to sustain us so that's my thoughts on 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 what uh, the things with the origin for the coronavirus uh, and yeah uh, as usual we have time for discussion thank you very much